No problem, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining the July 13th Independent Taxpayers Oversight Committee, better known as ITOC meeting. And thank you, staff, uh, for putting this report together and this meeting together. And I also want to thank everyone on uh, the virtual meeting and the web who has attended. As you can see, we are back to virtual again. And, uh, you know, we will still take live comments. Uh, so please raise your virtual hand. If you do have a comment, we will go through the instructions on how to make that happen. And clerk uh, has confirmed that we have uh, a quorum. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, before we actually get into the agenda, I would like to ask Carlos Diaz to walk us through uh, the in interpretation process. And uh, Buenos Dias, Carlos, go ahead. Good morning, Buenos Dias. <laughs> As the chair just indicated, interpretation is being provided for this meeting to use the service. Well, I will begin with Spanish, just so that they know, and I'll be back with the instructions in English. Buenos días, está ofreciendo servicio de interpretación al español. Para hacer uso del servicio, por favor, desplácese a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen sus controles. Ahí haga clic en el icono de interpretación, parece un globito terráqueo, y seleccione Spanish o Español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en celular, tablet, etcétera, presionaría primero los puntos suspensivos o más, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Por último, si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione Mute Original Audio o Silenciar Audio Original. Once again, interpretation is being provided to and from Spanish. In the event that there are any comments in Spanish, to take advantage of the feature, all you need to do is scroll down to the bottom of the Zoom screen where your meeting controls are. There you would click on the interpretation icon. It looks like a little world. And you would select English as your language. Now, if you are joining through the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone, tablet, or other mobile device, you would first press more, the three dots, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Gracias and thank you, Chairhouse. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, now I will ask our committee liaison, Zara, to provide uh, instructions uh, to the members of the public and the members on how to provide your comments. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Chair House. The members will be using their cameras and we will take live public comments. Members are asked to turn on their cameras when they have a comment or question and then Chair House will recognize you. As noted on the cover page of today's meeting agenda, in addition to emailing comments, the public may also provide live comments during today's meeting. In order to provide live comments, you can join today's Zoom meeting through the link or by dialing one of the numbers from your phone that are provided on the cover page of today's meeting agenda. Join the meeting by clicking on the join webinar link provided in the confirmation email you will receive upon registering. When public comments are called for, an, uh, for on an item, on the Zoom platform, click on the raise hand icon in the Zoom toolbar. The chair will call on you by the name you provided. If you are participating by telephone, press star nine. The chair will call on you by the last three digits of your telephone number. The instructions for providing live comments are also on the bottom of the cover page of today's meeting agenda, which can be accessed uh, from the homepage of Sandag's website at www.sandag.org. All comments, whether emailed or live, will be made a part of today's meeting record. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. Okay, uh, we'll now get started. And speaking of comments, we'll start with public comments and then also member comments. Uh, uh, Tessa, are there any public comments? I do not see any public commenters on this item. Very good. Uh, are there any members of ITALK who would like to say anything before we get started into the rest of the agenda items? I do not see any hands, so we're going to go ahead move to the next agenda item, uh, which is agency report. And welcome, Mr. Dujan. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your report. 
Uh, thank you, Chair House, and good morning, everyone. So I'm happy to share some great news from Sacramento for SANDAG and the San Diego region. Earlier this month, Governor Newsom signed a state budget package, which includes billions of dollars for public transit, active transportation, great separations, and climate adaptation projects. The biggest win for our region is $300 million SANDAG received for the Low Sand Rail Realignment Project near Del Mar. We've been talking about this project for decades, and with this funding, we can finally move the design and environmental work needed to move the tracks off of the bluffs. Additionally, this down payment provides the San Diego region the resources to leverage additional federal funding opportunities for construction. We are grateful for Senate President Pro Tem Atkins under her leadership we're able to make this year's state budget and we'll help make the vision in the regional plan a reality. I also want to recognize Senator Ben Hueso for securing $20 million for SANDAC to pay down bond balances. We're really proud of the work from the SANDAC staff who worked diligently to make this possible. In June, we also learned that we received a $1 million grant for the Buena Vista Lagoon Enhancement Project from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is a significant investment to complete environmental engineering and design work. This is something that we've also been working on for many years and is the last lagoon to be rehabilitated in the re region. We recently learned about the Rena litigation and the Court of Appeal issued its opinion in the case. The decision was in Sandak's favor on all accounts upholding the trial court's dismissal of the underlying lawsuit. The court found that the RENA statutory framework precludes judicial review of RENA determinations consistent with the City of Irvine versus Southern California Association of Government case that was a pr primary focus of the trial court's decision. The petitioning cities may seek further review at the California Supreme Court. If that happens, we should know by late summer whether the court will review the case. In other news, last month, Sandak, Caltrans, and MTS successfully launched the Bus and Shoulder Pilot Project as part of the South Bay Rapid Transit Road. While buses traveling on the shoulder is not a new idea, our project is the first in the country using transit vehicle to infrastructure technology, which allows buses to communicate with freeway ramp meters. The driver assistant technology includes sensors that monitor the lanes and provide audio and visual alerts to help operators avoid potential conflicts. We want to make sure that safety is at the forefront of this pilot project as we look to see how we can really maximize our current system and make transit more reliable for our communities. As you know, SANDAG Youth Opportunity Pass program started on May 1st. In one month, we increased youth transit ridership by 38% from the transit ridership count we received from our transit operators back in June. As the Youth Opportunity Pass program continues, we're excited to see how our youth can connect to the rest of our region. A quick update on the Central Mobility Hub project. At our next Board of Directors meeting, staff will provide the board with an updated plan for moving forward on the airport connection to the Central Mobility Hub. On Otay Mesa East, we are gearing up to celebrate the completion of the southbound SR-125 to westbound SR-905 connect the ramp. Completion of this collector will enhance regional mobility as a critical component of the SR-11 Otay Mesa East Port of Entry project, a federal, state, and local priority. The connector is one of the last remaining infrastructure improvements underway that will ultimately support mobility to and from the future port of entry, helping to fuel economic growth and bolster bi-national trade. There's also a nice warm-up to the groundbreaking of the port of entry that will happen later this year. I also want to share that we have recently completed our triennial review with the FTA or the Federal Transit Administration. SANDAG was highly praised by the FTA and the consultant who conducted the review. Some of the notes they gave us at the exit conference include, our commitment to DBE program is best in class and the nicest DPE documentation they have seen. Our 5310 program management is best in practice and coordination among departments is excellent at SANDAG. They also uh, praised our procurement file documentation and drawdown documentation and other, other areas during the process, such as our public participation process, equal opportunity opportunities, civil rights, and protest process. We welcome reviews like this because they make us a better agency. It was also great to hear from one of our most important funders that we are responsible steward of public funds. I want to make sure that you know the latest on the regional plan. Last Friday, the Board of Directors directed staff to
to update the regional plan with the removal of the road usage charge. Staff will begin this work and will update you uh, on the next steps. And lastly, I've been acting as a director of regional transportation services for the last several months, whose responsibilities include our tolling facilities on SR-125 and I-15, but I'm pleased to announce that we have hired a very well qualified candidate that will start in the position next month. That concludes my chair, uh, my report chair. I'll hand it back to you. Very well, Mr. Dijon, thank you so much. Uh, let's go to the public. Uh, are there any comments? I don't see any hands raised. I do not see any hands raised either. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, are there members of the committee who would like to comment? Please raise your hand, virtual hand. Uh, okay, Pedro. <laughs> Your right for hand is okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Andre. Thank you for that report. I have a question. Um, the twenty million dollars that Senator Wesso uh, secured for um, drawing down bonds are those specific to the SR one twenty five, or are they in general? I think that's a great question, uh, Mr. Orso, and I think. As we get more details from the bill, we will see exactly what we can apply those funds towards. Either SR 125, Sandag, or the commission, but we need to have further details. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, we will move on to the consent agenda item. Before uh, we do that, I wanna just make sure we have a very packed agenda with several uh, actions and discussions and approvals. So I would ask the committee members to be diligent in uh, making your motions and uh, work for seconds so we can be a little bit more swift in getting these agenda items approved. So with that, uh, we, the consent agenda item has two items. One is the meeting minutes that needs to be approved and the other is the draft uh, schedule of ITOC meeting. Can I have a motion to approve the consent items? Move approval. Thank you, Mr. Orso. Do I have a second? I second that. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Uh, please, clerk, go ahead and please take a vote. Um, I would like to first state for the record that there were no public comments on the consent agenda. Because <laughs> I didn't see any, but you're right. <laughs> we just need to state it um, on the record, Chair. Of course. <laughs> okay, so uh, roll call for item for the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. John, real estate right of way acquisition, Mr. Frankel. Frankel, yes. <laughs> Licensed civil traffic engineer, Mr. Kenny. Oh, Mr. Kenny is absent. He hasn't arrived yet. Contractor construction, Mr. Orso Delgado. Yes. Biology environmental, Mr. Fuller. Yes. Finance and budgeting, Vice Chair Halpern. Halpern, yes. Uh, licensed engineer is absent. And CEO, private sector, Chair House. Yes. Thank you. That item passes with those members present. Thank you, clerk. Uh, okay, we are now moving to item number five, which is actions by the Transportation Committee and Board of Directors, and Ariana is here to update us. Go ahead, Ariana. Thank you, Chair House. Uh, just a few updates since your last meeting. Last month, the board approved the continuation of teleconferenced and hybrid meetings. Last week, Chair House, uh, you delivered your 2022 ITOC annual report presentation to the board. And then as Andre mentioned, the board took action last Friday to remove the road usage charge from the 2021 regional plan revenue assumptions. And that's it. That's all I've got for you today. Okay. Are there any public comments? There are no public comments on this item. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any comments? I don't see any hands. <clears throat> Okay, we'll move on. Um, we are now uh, to item number six, which is the annual selection of ITOC chair and vice chair. Zara, go ahead and please uh, present this item. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair House. Good morning, ITOC members. The ITOC bylaws call for selection of a committee chair and vice chair by majority vote of the committee on an annual basis. The selection is to be made at the first regular meeting of the SANAC this year. An overview of the annual ITOC chair and vice chair selection process was provided to you at your June 14 meeting. ITOC members Dustin Fuller and vice chair helper will complete their terms in May 2023. This means that if they were to be appointed as chair or vice chair for FY 2023, they would only serve through May. Today, we are asking the committee to approve selection of a chair and vice chair for FY 2023. The new ITOC chair is expected to lead the next regulatory scheduled meeting on September 14, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. Are there any public comments on this particular item? There are no public commenters on this. Thank you, Tessa. Okay, here is the moment of truth. Please let me know who would like to volunteer to serve as chair or vice chair for this next term. Mr. Fuller, you have your camera on. Do you have a comment? No, I just want to see the action. <laughs> okay. Um, don't all jump in at the same time. <laughs> well, uh, is there anyone that would like to serve as chair next year or this year? Well, if I could, I'll, I'll, I'll break the ice. And um, in the spirit of um, rotating leadership, I would like to propose um, that Jonathan and Pedro serve in these roles and they fight it out between themselves as to who takes which. Thank you, uh, Mr. Halpern, for your nomination. Appreciate it. All right, so we have Jonathan and Pedro. What would you like to do? <laughs> You're on the spot now. <laughs> Madam Chair, I would gladly volunteer as a vice chair. <laughs> uh -oh. All right, Jonathan. <laughs> um, I would, yes, I would. Uh, I would be happy to serve as chair if that is the uh, if that is the direction and desire of the other committee members. Wonderful. We have a nomination for um, Mr. Orso as vice chair and Mr. Frankel as chair. So we would like now to go to a vote. Um, clerk? Um, Chair House, I do need a second for that motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll second the motion. There you go. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fuller. I'm sorry. Uh, Fuller? Mr. Fuller? Yes. A second? Yes. Mr. Okay. Thank we have you. A motion by Mr. Halpern and a second by Mr. Fuller. Do we need to? Well, we already asked for public comments, so. Yes, ma'am. All right. On item number six, Mr. Frankel. Go yes. <laughs> Mr. Kenny is absent. Mr. Orso Delgado. Yes. Mr. Fuller. Yes. Vice Chair Halpern. Hal Halpern, yes. Mr. Hopper is absent and Chair House. Yes. That item passes unanimously with those members present. Wonderful, congratulations to both of you. And I wish you the best in, the, in this coming year. Mr. Frankel will be chairing the first meeting in September as Zara mentioned. Okay. Ma gonna... Madam Chair. Yes. For your, your excitement on this item, I, I, I would say condolences are more in order. But thank you. I have all the confidence in both of you. You will do great. So it's a good learning experience, and I'm very honored and happy to have served in this position. So, okay, let's move on. Uh, we have item number seven, which is the state of commute subcommittee. This is another action that needs to be approved. So I will be looking for a motion in a second. Uh, uh, Grace, please go ahead and present this item. Hi, good morning, committee members. Um, is the slide up or 
is there a recommendation slide to be pulled up? Oh, there, there, it, is. there it is. Um, the ITOC is asked to appoint no more than three ITOC members to serve on its 2022 State of the Commute, Commute Subcommittee. I want to thank um, Dustin Fuller, Les Hopper, and Mike Kinney for serving on the ITOC subcommittee this last fiscal year. And so we are asking uh, for new subcommittee members for, oh, for it should say 2023. Yes. I apologize for that. That's supposed to say 2023 State of the Commute subcommittee for this fiscal year. Okay, so time for more volunteering. Um, are there any uh, members of the public who have any comments? There are no public comments. Okay, uh, so we're looking for volunteers. Anyone is interested in serving in the subcommittee? This sounds like a fun committee, so I would. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Pedro. Anyone else? If, if before we, um, if I could just ask a question, sort of point of information type thing, could, could you, just, Grace, perhaps just quickly review the time frame um, again for us so that um, we understand when the work is expected to be done? Yes. So the annual state of the commute um, compiles information for each calendar year. And so um, because we're in calendar year 2022 we have to wait till early um like january february time frame to download all the data that's happened in calendar year 2022 and then from there we provide a draft um this year however we are trying to steer away from the uh, flat file pdf and we are creating interim dashboards so that the um, state of the commute will now be an interactive dashboard and so um, i would say that we would be coming to the state of the commute subcommittee possibly early winter next year like january or february time frame with a draft of, and then we would have, after getting feedback from you all, then we would incorporate your revisions and feedback, and then we would send it out to you again, and we would meet with you um, probably in the spring, and then we come back to the full I talk like in May and June for an approval of the, the report. Okay. So it sounds like even outgoing members uh, could serve on this committee uh, since the timing is around the same time as the uh, uh, the termination of their term. Is that correct? Yes, I would correct. Okay. Very, very deftly done, Chair House, and steering, yes. steering yes. this opportunity. Well, you know, given that, um, you know, Les and Mike aren't here and they may be wildly enthusiastic about doing this, um, but given the timing, I just want to clarify because, uh, you know, I appreciate Jonathan Pedro stepping up in the leadership position. So I'd be happy to volunteer for this if, um, unless we hear back later that Mike and Les are dying to do it. Okay, okay very good. Uh, Mr. Orso and Mr. Halpern so far, anyone else yet? If not, I would like to nominate Mr. Uh, 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 Ashley Hopper to also go ahead and stay on. He's he's already been on the committee and he told me he'll do anything I ask him. So <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you don't attend a meeting? <laughs> so we have three members. I, I'm looking for a motion to nominate and approve Mr. Orso, Mr. Halpern and Mr. Hopper to the subcommittee uh, for a state of commute. I would move that motion. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Do we have a second? Second that. All right, Mr. Fra Frankel, go ahead and the clerk uh, ask for the vote. For item number seven, Mr. Frankel. Frankel, yes. Mr. Kenny is absent. Mr. Orso Delgado. Yes. Mr. Fuller. <laughs> yes. Vice Chair Halpern. Yes. Mr. Hopper is absent and Chair House. Yes. And that item passes unanimously with those members present. Very well, thank you, Clerk. Okay, moving on to item number eight, which is the proposed amendment to the Transit Extension Ordinance for ITOC membership and selection process. This is something that the ITOC 
subcommittee has been working and collaborating with our talk members for really throughout the whole year. And uh, we are now at a point that we would like uh, to basically make some recommendations to the board. This item is presented by Zara and uh, Mr. Franco. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, please. Yes. Um, thank you. Good morning again, our talk members. Uh, I will provide you a, a background for this report. Uh, the FY 2021 uh, Transnet Triannual Performance Audit included four recommendations specific to ITOC practices. Two of these recommendations focus on ITOC membership and selection process. In October 2021, the ITOC appointed a subcommittee to consider Transnet ordinance amendments consisting of Mr. Jonathan Franco as a subcommittee chair, Chair Sonny House, and Vice Chair Stuart Halpern. Since then, staff has been working with the subcommittee to address those audit recommendations. This report focuses on the proposed amendments. I will now turn it over to Jonathan to provide an update on the status of the proposed amendments. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zara and committee members. Uh, good morning. Uh, this, as you know, is a continuation from our June 14 meeting uh, where we did discuss this item, so I'll be very brief. Um, the proposed uh, ordinance amendments are included in attachment one to the agenda packet this morning um, and generally focus on two things. One is the creation of two additional seats on the ITOC. One seat uh, would be filled by an individual with experience in emerging transportation technology, and the second seat would be filled by a, a transportation user. Uh, the second uh, amendment is related to the selection process for ITOC members and clarifies which elected officials can be a part of that, as well as adds an ex officio a member from the board, uh, excuse me, from the committee. Um, and so that would be the chair, vice chair would serve uh, as ex officio member. Um, so we are asking um, you to recommend to the board approval of these ordinance amendments today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Franco. Let's go to the public and see if there are any comments. There are no public commenters on this item. Thank you very much. Uh, since this is an item for approval, I would like to ask uh, for a motion and second, then we will have discussion uh, before the vote. Are there any, is any, would anyone like to make a motion for recommendation? I'd, oh. be, I'd be happy to move the recommendation forward. Thank you very much. Uh, and I need a second. I will second that. Mr. Orso, thank you. Are there any comments, discussions uh, by the ITOC members? Okay, I'm not hearing any. So Tessa, go ahead, please take a vote. On item number eight, Mr. Frankel. Frankel, yes. Mr. Kenny is absent. Mr. Orso Delgado. Yes. Mr. Fuller. Yes, and I'd like to add uh, appreciation to Mr. Frankel for all his work on this. Vice Chair Halpern. Halpern, yes. Mr. Hopper is absent and Chair House. Uh, yes. That item passes unanimously with those members present. Thank you. And thank you again from uh, members of the subcommittee as well as staff who worked on this throughout the year and our independent council who helped us get to this point. Our work continues now because we do need to take a look at the bylaws which are affected by this item now. And I think it would be good for the subcommittee to continue the work uh, to uh, come back to ITOC with bylaws amendments as well, so that we can take the full uh, changes to the ordinance and the bylaws uh, to the board later this year. So, um, so we will continue that and I would ask the um, uh, staff to schedule maybe our next subcommittee meeting to be able to do that. Okay, moving on to item number nine, which is a Transnet Smart Growth Incentive Program Amendment request. Ms. Uh, Fershaw, please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, um, yeah, you need my, to. Is my camera on now? <laughs> yeah, but 
Oh, there we go. Now we can see you. <laughs> Apologies for the lateness. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm here today. Uh, the city of Lemon Grove is requesting a change in scope of work and a 14 month time extension for the Connect Main Street phase one and two smart growth incentive program. The Connect Main Street project encompasses approximately four blocks along Main Street, uh, the Broadway, uh, from Broadway to San Miguel. Um, it, attachment one, page seven, will give you a little visual um, of, about what, what the uh, footprint of the project is. Uh, the project constructs complete street amenities, which include enhanced pedestrian and bicycle facilities, um, a pedestrian trail, shared use path, enhanced crosswalks, safety lighting, and landscape features. So the project's footprint um, includes improvements that impact an at-grade rail crossing at San Miguel. So the rail crossing improvements, um, of course, require um, approval and authorization from the California Public Utilities um, co uh, company, uh, agency, sorry, <laughs> uh, the CPUC. And coordination with the CPUC started in early 2021. Um, over the course of these meetings, CPUC staff um, were asked, uh, have asked that additional upgrades be made at the crossing. And Lemon, Lemon Grove staff um, has estimated that these additional elements will result in a cost of over a million dollars. So due to the costs of the additional rail crossing improvements, um, increased project construction costs, and the limited resources available at the city at this time, the city is requesting to scale down the project approximately one block, excluding the crossing at this time, and looking for additional funding later to complete the project as whole as it is um, as it was uh, firstly, uh, first competitively um, uh, awarded. And the focus of and focus on constructing the remaining amenities along Main Street. So, due to the extensive time and coordination efforts that have impacted the project's original schedule, the city is also requesting a 14-month time extension. So, uh, today the ITOC is asked to recommend that the Regional Planning Committee approve scope of work change and a 14-month time extension for the City of Lemon Grove. Um, projects for the city of Lemon Grove's Connect Main Street Smart Growth Improvement Project. This concludes my report, and I have representatives from the city of Lemon Grove here today to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Versha. Uh, are there any public comments on this item? There are no public commenters on this. Okay. Are there any members of the public? I, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, ITOP looks like Mr. Orso has his hand up. Yes, I would like to hear from the <clears throat> city of Lemon Grove. And specifically, my concern is, is, is twofold. One, um, I understand the, the, the challenges with the CPUC, um, but then I don't understand if you remove that challenge, why do you need the 14 month extension um, to complete the project? And what assurances um, do we have that you are going to um, close that gap? And, 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 and when are you thinking of securing the additional funding? Thank you, Mr. Orso. Uh, I can respond to your questions. So, I mean, maybe I can give you a little bit more background. The city was awarded a grant for segments one and two of Connect Main Street and a separate grant that was through Sandag Smart Growth Grant and a second grant for segment three of Connect Main Street through um, the California uh, Natural Resources Agency, CNRA. Um, so the overall project um, was about $4 million in construction funding that we had. Um, maybe it was three and a half. And when we got to working with the CPUC, they basically asked us to do all these additional improvements at the crossing, and including a pre-signal, um, which added about a million dollars, like Tracy mentioned. That was about four and a half million then that we had. Uh, and then Recently, construction costs have gone out up significantly, which added close to another million dollars to the project. 
So we have reached out to Sandag and CNRA, both of them asking if we can trim the project back by one block on each of their segments. And then we reached out to CPUC to see if this would alleviate their current concerns. And they have, um, yes, they've said that it would alleviate their, their concerns and that we could move forward with the projects, both projects separately, leaving a two gap, two block gap in the middle. Now, we're, the city is actively going to be looking for grant funding through that active transportation program, through the next round of smart growth, which is happening soon, I believe at the end of this year, um, to, to fill that gap. They're also actively looking for funding for segments four, five, six, and seven of the overall Connect Main Street project and plan. I might've missed one of your questions there. The other piece, Matt, um, is basically um, if you are eliminating but your the roadblocks, um, no pun intended, um, in the two rail crossings, why do you need the additional 14 months to be able to deliver the project if you're making it smaller and, and, and easier to build now? Yeah, honestly, I think we only need about six to eight additional months, but we wanted to just be conservative and put in enough time to make sure that we definitely will not have to come back to see you again. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments? I have some questions, but are there any other members? Mr. Frankel, go ahead. Thank you, Chair House, um, and perhaps this is for the city. Uh, it seems like the grant was originally awarded uh, in July of 2018, uh, but coordination with CPUC didn't begin until early 2021. So there was a two and a half year gap between the award of the grant and coordination with CPUC. What, what, was, go what was going on during that two and a half year period uh, and why wasn't coordination started earlier? Yes, thank you, Mr. Frankel. So in the, when we were awarded the grant, um, the city did not have a um, climate action plan. And part of the uh, requirement for actually getting the, the agreement, the grant agreement was to complete the climate action plan. I believe that took about a year and a half. So we really didn't get started until about a year and a half after we were awarded the grant. Um, my timeline might be a little off. Tracy could confirm that, but I'm pretty sure that was about a year and a half delay of the start of the project. Is that yeah, correct? Yes, I can confirm that there was a, um, a climate, the city of Lemon Grove did have a year to um, complete their uh, uh, climate action plan before starting the grant agreement. So, but the grant agreement actually um, was initiated in, I mean, it was awarded awarded in July, but the, the actual uh, grant agreement term, I believe did not start until 2019. I can look that up and and, um, and uh, forward that to you if you're in, in I, but I know it started later than the 20, then it was awarded. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Chair House, I have one additional question. And Who's Matt, that? you alluded to this, which is construction cost increases. Obviously, over this four years, costs have gone up substantially. Um, and what level of confidence do you have or information do you have to suggest that the two and a half million is sufficient to complete the revised project? Yeah, we have. So our plan is to go out to bid in the next, by the end of the year. So we're not planning to slow anything down. Uh, so we're hoping that we can get some good competitive bids based on the current prices. And we have some, some float right now in our budget by removing that one block on each grant. We actually have an extra three or 400,000 in beyond our normal 20% construction contingency. So I'm very confident that we have enough money to, to build the project if we remove this one block. And I Thank honestly you. think we might actually give some money back to one or both of the granting agencies at the end of the project. Thank you. Okay. So an answer, so an answer, I just wanted as a follow-up, um, the, the term of the grant agreement did not start until July of 2020. Mm. Okay. Uh, that was one of my questions, uh, Tracy, 
uh, there's a timeline that the grant has to be expended, right? Is that like a two year? Yes. Uh, so it goes to um, right now, it, it goes to um, January of 2024. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess my question is, uh, first of all, with the reduced project, removing the two blocks, does the project still meet the intent and the criteria for the grant? It's um, well, it, it's the it's a complete street uh, corridor um, along Main Street, which is the uh, the main street of downtown in Lemon Grove. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think I I think well, it's staff's um, belief that it does it it, it does um, uh, still in. And the intent is still the um, the amenities and everything that are they'll still be there. Um, I think we had a long conversation. We've had some conversations with Matt and um, his folks over at CRA and as well as the city of Lemon Grove to make sure that the amenities um, aren't going to be um, impacted. Okay. Yeah, I can add that the three blocks that we are still going to build, we're going to build exactly what we originally planned for. And those three blocks are the closest to the smart growth area. Okay. Fourth block is actually furthest away from the core smart growth area in the, in the city. Okay. Um, and I do have some concerns also, Matt and Tracy, about the fact that the letter, the city's letter says they will, you will hold the uh, construction schedule or duration uh, when in fact you have two blocks less to construct. So I know you're trying to have a cushion and trying to, you know, not come back, but, you know, the, the public needs to be able to take advantage of these, uh, these amenities. And the longer you have to work with, the longer the delay to the public, uh, to the use of, of, of facilities for the public. So uh, is there any consideration for shortening your duration because you really don't need the original duration uh, construction schedule? Yes, I agree with that. Our duration for construction should be no more than a year instead of the original in the, the grant allows up to 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I concur with that. And as I said before, I would be happy with just a six or eight month extension I think we can easily get everything done in that time frame. We just wanted to add a little more to be safe. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I would be comfortable supporting the city's request with the six month extension. Okay. Is that doable uh, for you all? I know we don't have a representative from the city themselves, but I know Matt, you're representing them. Uh, let us know if the six month would do because I, I don't agree with their requested extension at this point. Yes, I think that the city would be comfortable with that. Six month extension? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is an item for action and recommendation. Uh, so I would uh, like to know then, Mr. Orso, would you like to make that a motion? I, I, I would like to make that a motion with the amendment that it would only be a six month extension. Very well. Is there a second to this uh, motion? Chair House, I'll, I'll second that motion. Very well. Okay, we do have a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion or uh, uh, questions, comments? Mr. Halford. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just one comment, and I guess I would direct this perhaps um, to Tracy or other Sandex staff. I think, you know, Sonny, you raise a good point um, about the scope of the project. So I would just suggest that, you know, going forward for things of this nature, when um, prospective amendments changes are brought to the committee, that the staff perhaps in combination with the requesting entity make very, very clear in the presentation that the scope of the project um, is not changing such that there would be any conflict with the um, purpose of this particular type of uh, grant, if you will. 
Um, in other words, that the even the changed project would still qualify. That if there's a very clear affirmative statement to that effect in the presentation materials, that would be helpful. Thanks. I think that's a very good point, Mr. Halpern. It's sort of like a reevaluation of the grant process to make sure, and staff needs to report on that. I agree with that. Yeah, because one, one of our core responsibilities is to ensure that the recipients are getting the money pursuant yes. to the requirements of the ordinance. And again, I think, just think it would be help, helpful in any presentation of this type that there be a very explicit statement that staff has re-reviewed the requirements, et cetera, and that the project still qualifies. But otherwise, I'd be happy to vote in favor. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hershaw, do you have any uh, comments or any? No, I, I think that's an excellent, yeah, excellent um, suggestion is something that we'll implement for in the future, sure. Okay. So we do have a motion and a second, and uh, clerk, please go ahead and take a vote for recommendations. For item number nine, Mr. Frankel. Frankel, yes. Mr. Kenny is absent. Mr. Orso Delgado. Yes. Mr. Fuller. Yes. Vice Chair Halpern. Yes. Mr. Hopper is absent and Chair House. Yes. Thank you. That item passes unanimously with those members present. Thank you. Thank you, very you. Much. Thank you Matt. Thank you. For your present. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on now to item number 10, Transit Environmental Mitigation Program Land Management Grant Program Cycle 10, Call for Projects uh, and Funding Recommendations. And uh, let's see, Ms. Smith, and I don't know, I'm going to pronounce your name correctly, Courtney. <laughs> uh, Pesh. Pesh. Very good. Ms. Pesh, go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. And Ms. Smith is not here today. Um, I, so uh, good morning. My name is Courtney Pesh, and I'm a regional planner, too, for the environmental compliance team here at SANDAG. Item 10 on your agenda is located on page 35, and it contains the draft project rankings and funding recommendations for the 10th cycle of the Environmental Mitigation Program, also referred to as the EMP, Land Management Grant Program. These grants provide funding to help maintain the integrity of existing regional habitat preserves through enhanced land management and are a key component of the EMP. You'll recall that the call for projects was presented to the ITOC in April of 2021 and was approved by the SANDAG Board of Directors later that fall. Today's presentation is intended to provide information and allow for any discussion on these draft project re rankings and funding recommendations. Any discussion today will be presented to the SANDAG Board of Directors this September. Next slide, please. I would like to provide some background information on the program before we jump into the recommendations, specifically the purpose. The purpose of the land management grant program is to assist regional land managers with the protection of threatened, rare, and endangered species and enhance their habitats to avoid the future listing of endangered species while promoting regional habitat conservation planning. This funding provides a safety net to protect our investments and in turn to help avoid the future listing of endangered species and reducing permitting and mitigation costs. There has been nine previous grant cycles that have awarded a total of 117 grants through a competitive process. Approximately $16.4 million has been awarded and an additional $10 million in matching funds has been provided by grantees. Now, by, before I go further into detail on the 10 cycle recommendations, I wanted to provide you all with an excellent example of a successful project from the ninth cycle of land management grants. On the screen above you, you'll see a series of photos that were taken by the Port of San Diego for their threatened and endangered species stewardship at D Street's Phil project back in the spring of 2020. The EMP grant was awarded in November of 2018, which you'll see the before image on the left side of your screen. This, award, this grant was to prepare the site for the 2019 and 2020 nesting seasons by performing management required to maintain the 30 acre site suitable for breeding and nesting habitat 
For the federally and state listed endangered species, the California least terns and the western snowy plovers, which you'll see on the right side of your screen. These activities included site grading, debris removal, vegetation monitoring, predator management, avian monitoring, and hosting volunteer events to engage and educate the surrounding communities. As you look to the after picture on the right side of your screen, you'll see that the site has been cleared and leveled, which is the ideal habitat for the terns and for the plovers. The project has since closed and has continued long-term maintenance of the site. Now for the 10 cycle of land management grants, applications were due on January 31st of 2022. In total, 29 applications were submitted for the $2.4 million available in funding. Of the 29 applications, 19 are recommended for funding. Next slide, please. As described in the call for projects, the funding available for the 10 cycle of land management grants was split into two categories. On the left side of your screen, you'll see the threats reduction stewardship category which is intended to provide gap funding to assist regional land managers with short-term stewardship activities to reduce threats on conserved lands. Projects must be completed within 18 month, months and can be awarded a maximum of $80,000 each. Now on the right side of your screen, you'll see the species and habitat recovery category, which is intended to fund longer term, larger scale habitat restoration and enhancement projects with an emphasis on management strategic plan priority species and their habitats. Projects can be awarded a maximum of $1.6 million and should be completed within three to five years. The EMP Working Group selected an evaluation committee at its March 2020 meeting, and that committee met in March of 2022 to review applications for funding the cycle. Consistent with all grant program evaluations, a sum of ranks approach was used to rank these projects. Based on the evaluation committee's rankings, the EMP working group recommends funding 11 projects in the threat reduction stewardship category, totaling approximately $817,602.46. These projects recommended for funding are highlighted in gray in attachment one, and can be found on pages 37 and 38 of the report. As you can see in the attachment, funding is recommended for a variety of projects, including small-scale invasive species removal and the installation of fencing and signage to promote authorized trail use. In addition, the EMP Working Group recommends funding eight projects in the Species and Habitat Recovery category, totaling 1582000 $397.54. Projects recommended for funding are also highlighted in gray in attachment two and can be found on pages 39 and 40 of the report. As you look to attachment two, funding is recommended for a wide range of projects, including large scale invasive species removal and the restoration of coastal cactus run habitat. I wanna note that the evaluation committee determines to allocate $17,602.46 from the species and habitat recovery category and reallocate those funds to the threat reduction stewardship category in order to award to a greater number of grantees and to further promote regional habitat conservation goals. Lastly, I want to highlight that this cycle incorporated new criterion to better align with SANDAG's new commitment to equity statement adopted by the SANDAG Board of Directors in February of 2021. SANDAG staff added evaluating language that scores projects higher for fostering social equity or providing potential co-benefits to community-based organization network communities, also referred to as CBO network communities. We are proud to say of the 19 selected projects for funding, 16 received additional points for fostering social equity or providing potential co-benefits to CBO network communities. These activities include engaging the California Conservation Corps to perform invasive species removal, restoring open space in a CBO network community, and providing educational opportunities on environmental conservation in San Diego County to CBO network communities. It is important to note that these ranking spreadsheets were peer reviewed for accuracy 
and all projects that applied for funding this cycle were deemed eligible. Next slide, please. So what are our next steps? After today, SANDAC staff will bring the project rankings to the regional planning and transportation committees this September for recommendation. Later in September, staff will bring the regional planning and transportation committee's recommendations to the SANDAC board of directors for approval. If approved by the SANDAC board of directors, grant agreements will be executed this fall. Next slide, please. Therefore, the ITOC is asked to review the information in the report and the attachments to ensure that the projects recommended for funding are consistent with the transit extension ordinance provisions. As a reminder, today's item is for uh, information and discussion only. That concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have on the funding recommendations, and my contact information is on the slide above. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pesh. Uh, first, let's go to the members of the public. Are there any comments? I do not see any public commenters on this slide. Thank you, clerk. Now we move on to member comments. Are there any questions, comments by the members of ITA? I'd just like to say this is my favorite time of the year. <laughs> and Keith, good to see you. Um, Courtney, thank you for the presentation. I just, I have no comments on it, just wide variety of, of really good projects. Um, I did like that you put down the lease terms up there and I'm just curious if you have any information on uh, whether or not they were successful or if they had a bunch of breeding pairs or if it was just solely to prep the site for for them. I don't have that information off the top of my head, but I definitely can get that to you. I believe that they, I believe that there were some breeding pairs on the site, but it was mainly to prepare the site for the breeding seasons. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's all I've got. I, I thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Any other comments? Mr. Halper. Um, thanks. I appreciate the presentation. I've got a related question that is not specific to the grant program itself, but while Keith's here, maybe he could um, speak to this. My understanding is that um, Sandag board member, county uh, supervisor, uh, Tara Lawson Reamer has convened at the county level a working group to look at ways to encourage native plantings in public and private projects. I'm curious if you guys are aware of that, participating in that, if there's anything you can speak to in terms of how Sandeg may have a role. Uh, hello, ITAC members. Um, Keith Greer, I'm the manager of our environmental compliance group. And one of the provisions of my um, oversight is the EMP program. Uh, Stuart, yeah, so we're aware of that program and we've been involved with county staff in terms of its rollout. We're not, um, I think Senate's role in that would be one towards encouraging, um, kind of helping facilitate that kind of outrage as opposed to taking a primary lead in that. But we continue to play active roles with the county in terms of facilitating all habitat conservation throughout the region. Gotcha, so as part of that, to the extent that there's, you know, plantings being done on uh, relating to sand egg projects and lands and whatnot. So you'd be working, presumably, I You'd be working consistent with the goals of that to try to use native plantings and that sort of thing for habitat preservation. And Absolutely. So one of the projects I give you is the Delmar Bluffs project. We only include native plantings in our plantings now for any kind of native habitat areas. And so the Delmar Bluffs, we're using 100% coastal habitat plants. Great. Thanks. Appreciate it. Very well. Any other member comments? Uh, I do have a question myself. Um, I see that you had a good number of applicants, but not everyone was successful and not everyone ranked as high. Uh, do you offer debriefs to the applicants and do they know that they have an opportunity to get a debrief about what they can do to improve their application process? And I can take that, Courtney. So Madam Chair, yes, we do offer debriefs to every applicant, including those ones that weren't successful. We did that after the board takes their action and has a final approval list. Very good. Okay, because it's always nice to know what you could do better to win in, you know, these grants and it's a wonderful opportunity. So thank you, Mr. Greer and Ms. Pesh for your presentation. And we will now move on to item number 11, which is the uh, 2021 Regional Transportation Improvement 
Looks like we have another amendment, number 13. And Mr. Ratcliffe, uh, welcome and go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members of the ITOC. Item number 11 is Amendment 13 to the 2021 Regional Transportation Improvement Program, or RTIP. On July 15th, the Transportation Committee is expected to approve Amendment 13. The ITOC is asked to provide feedback on the proposed amendment, focusing its review on the TransNet funded projects. Amendment 13 is a regular quarterly amendment that's being processed to accommodate changes to projects in the SANDAG FY22 program budget, as well as other changes requested by Caltrans and the transit agencies. Attachment one, beginning on page 44 of the agenda, is the summary of changes report, showing the prior and revised project cost, the cost difference, and the percent change in each project. The table has been sorted in descending order by the absolute value of the change in dollars. Some key changes in this amendment include the programming of various changes to the SANDAG annual budget, some updates to the State Highway Operations and Protection Program, or SHOP, programming updates made by the transit agencies to align their programming with the actual FY 2022 FTA apportionments, and the programming of supplemental FTA Section 5310 Specialized Transportation Grant Program Cycle 11 funds as approved by the board on July 8th. Please note that there is also a mistake on the first page of attachment one uh, for project SAN 66. The cost difference is actually $18,600 and not 18.6 million. That error is due to a calculation error with the cell. It should have been divided by 1000 to be consistent with the rest of the attachment. In attachment two, beginning on page 47, you will find the changes proposed in this amendment, specifically for the projects funded with Transnet. Each project lists Transnet at the top, followed by any other funding programmed on the project. The tables also, also show the Transnet subtotals and other funding subtotals to show you how much Transnet and other funds are programmed. Attachment three shows any changes that were made during the public comment period. And finally, attachment four summarizes the transnet eligibility requirements analysis for amendment 13. That concludes my report and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Radcliffe. Are there any public comments on this item? I do not see any public commenters for this item. Okay. Uh, are there any members of ITOC who have questions or comments? I don't see any. Um, Mr. Oka, looks like you have a comment. I do, I do have a question more than, more than anything. I always find um, these tables a little bit hard to follow. Um, so if I'm looking at table two on attachment two, and let's take, for example, um, the first project, Interstate 5, HOV Managed Lanes. So mm -hmm. on the first line, you have Transnet MC, and it says a total of 168,841 and prior 136,475. So is the delta um, the increase that we're looking at in Transnet funds between the total and the prior? No, actually what it is, is if you look at that particular, the, the table for Cal 09 there for that project you're looking at, those two columns that are next to each other, the total and the prior, the total is the total uh, for basically the amounts across to your right. So prior plus 21, 22, 23, and so on. What you wanna to do to compare, to basically identify the changes in this particular amendment. If you look at the lower, the bottom table, it says project last amended in 21-10. And that means that the project was last included and amended in amendment 10, which was brought to you guys, um, I believe in May. Um, and then, so what you would wanna do is you'd wanna compare, look at each fund type and then basically compare the the total columns there, the amounts in the total column, 
um, against that lower table. So, so what is the difference on this project? So this project actually had no change to the dollars. If you notice that the very bottom, right, right. Uh, you can see that the total for Amendment 13 is 907455, and the total was the same in the last amendment. This particular project, we basically just updated the project description to include that language that you can see there where it says that toll credits will be used as the match for the federal funds. That's in your yeah. It's in the project description field there at the Perhaps to see the the change, the comparison between the two tables, Richard, maybe we can illustrate a different project, like the next one on the following page, Cal 38, maybe? Could you? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, can so you, Cal, uh, I'm Cal, sorry, can you refer to the page number so everyone can keep up? Yeah, sorry. So it's page 48 of the agenda that Ariana is referring to. Okay. And looking there, you can see as an example that the Transnet border funding decreased. If you look at the total for Amendment 13, it says 1527, and it was previously 1583. Got you. I know, it's a little bit of legwork, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, I hear you. I wonder if there is a way to try to synthesize this, and I guess you're trying to do that with the previous summary tables, right? Right, yes, correct. Yeah, that has been uh, kind of an evolving attachment. Um, we've kind of taken feedback from members of the ITOC over the years, and um, this is the current uh, style and, and uh, format of that attachment, yeah. Right, okay. so in, the, some, in that summary table paper, we try to indicate which fund types change. So at least it's mm -hmm. easier for you to go and identify on the tables. I get it, I get it. It's just, it's always been nine mummy to me. <laughs> it's a lot but of numbers. Thank it's you. a lot of numbers. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? I do have a couple of questions myself. Uh, thank you for the correction, uh, Mr. Radcliffe. Sure. Thank um, you for catching that. <laughs> <laughs> Mind of an engineer. I can't help. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess I want to know, for example, State Route 11. It's a huge change in numbers. What causes such, such a big change in numbers? 106 million added. I believe we have someone available to answer questions on that project. Yeah, I don't see that Maria popped in. Um, oh. I think, yeah, we had we had requested the project manager. She has her, um, sorry, she has her hand raised, but she needs to be promoted. Uh, production. Oh, team. okay. Can we please promote Thanks. us? Thank you. There she is. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Maria Rodriguez. I'm the project manager for the Otamesa East Port of Entry. Yes, go ahead, Maria. Hi. Good seeing you. So uh, back in April, we started to do an update of all of our cost estimates. The date on those cost estimates were arranged between 2016 and 2018. So we brought them to today's dollars and with the current market conditions, there was a large change. Uh, you're right, and about $106 million in changes. So we accounted for that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if in the next go around, in the next six months, that number could increase even more because we're seeing escalation rates at 9% right now. I think back in, in April, when we did this, we accounted for 7%. Um, so I'm ready to do another revised estimate in the coming months again to reassess the market and, and figure out where we stand. But you're right, the market is very unpredictable. There are supply chain um, problems and uh, we're doing the best we can to keep up with everything that, that is going on nationwide. So Maria, are you attributing the entire 13% increase to just inflation? and construction prices, or are there change in scope? Well, the project was delayed by a few years. I mean, that RTIP assumed begin construction, I, I think this year. And 
and that's not going to happen this year. Um, it's it's getting moved by a year, a year and a half, right? So uh, we needed to re-update, br bring them up to the new schedule, and then the escalation and the supply chain. So it's a mix of, of reasons why it went up so much. Has the scope changed, or is it the, the same? Scope has not changed. The scope has not changed. We we do know more about the scope now because we concluded with CBP. Uh, customs and Border Protection, we concluded last year the program of requirements. It's this document with all of the specification and requirements for the port of entry facility. So now we were able to cost better the, the port itself. So that, that was part of it as well. Okay, so really escalation, again, I'm asking, you're attributing the entire 30% increase in because of escalation in prices then? Escalation, crisis, and um, a more detailed scope of work. Okay, because okay. that's a huge increase. Uh, and that concerns me about other projects, you know, and what construction uh, costs are going to do to our program. So um, I do also want to know, um, you know, uh, actually, this is for Mr. Radcliffe. Uh, the cost difference, when I look at it, is like 128 million total. Um, you know, when you look at all the ups and downs, but on, the request is only 11 million. I'm assuming that's the transmit piece of it. Is there a chance or a way for you to add the transmit another column that just shows the transmit dollars that we are looking at, uh, in addition to the total cost difference? in your summary table. So it's easier for us to see really what the transmit fund impacts are. Sure, yeah, I believe that's something that we can work to incorporate into this attachment. Yeah, because I, I never understood this table because when I add things up, I'm going, well, that's not 11 million, that's 128 million. So right. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, there is so many pages going through each of them to try to find the information. This. This committee is really concerned about the transit dollars, so it would be helpful if we have that added up. So, yes, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, it's basically what we try to do is we try to provide you, we provide the TC with the overall um, increase or decrease to the overall program, including state and federal funds. But for you guys, we just try to narrow it to just the the increase or decrease to Transnet, and so that's what you see with that eleven million. Thank you, I appreciate that. So, um, Mr. Orso, do you have another comment? Yeah, uh, um, Richard, so if I understand correctly, uh, regardless of the ups and downs, the 11 million transit dollars um, that, that is stated in the uh, report, is that money that's already been secured and 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 basically, you're going through the motions of getting the approval to secure that additional funding. Because what I understand is that if you look at all of the projects with the ups and downs and stuff like that, you guys do whatever you need to do to try to balance everything out, and then the various projects, like I, I believe, Walter Mesa East. Uh, they have secure additional funding. So you, all you're doing is you're programming the dollars through these amendments on the RTIP. Am, am I correct or am I wrong on that? Yeah, so basically that $11 million comes from the financial summary table that we actually take to the Transportation Committee as an attachment. And basically what it is, is it basically just shows versus the previous amendment um, what has changed. And so basically it looks at it by fiscal year and it shows that uh, in the prior amendment that it was this much in this fiscal year and now it's this much. And then basically it's, it totals that and gives us that amount that you see there on the recover report as 11 million. So basically- I understand, I understand that. My question is, have the 11 million been secured so that they could be spent on the projects. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep, they have. Ms. Alpert, do you have anything to add? 
Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that the 11 million um, or all, all the transnet that we program is reflected um, in the Sandag budget. So these are available funds. And, um, you know, we, we you might have heard we had a pretty big increase in um, in transnet this year. And, uh, and I, I would hazard a guess there's an increase here to a project um, San 80, which is our um, the support of our rail and bus programs that are transnet funded. Um, and that is to help operate Midcoast. So that was additional funding that was programmed from the BRT um, balance, I would say, that's been kind of sitting out there. Very good. Mr. Frankel, go ahead. Thank you, Chair House. Uh, one additional question regarding the State Route 11 project. It looks like in looking at the line items, about 100 million uh, is, is increased in the local funds category. What, what, is that, what is that category comprised of when we're talking about local funds? I think I'll start it and then I'll pass it to Andre. Um, so the, the State Route 11 Otamesa is the remaining components, which are the port of entry, the ITS, and the commercial vehicle enforcement facility will be funded through a TPA loan and the bonds. So the local is what we're calling bonds. Um, and, and I'll let Andre explain the specifics. Yeah, no, Maria, it's just like uh, you mentioned. So generally, we try to apply for TIFIA funding because it's the lowest cost of funding available to us. And then we augment that with um, bonds similar to SR125, our transnet, et cetera. And so um, we're trying to apply for the maximum amount of TIFIA loan and then transnet, um, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, bond funding. And this will be its brand new uh, official statement. It'll be its own indenture, uh, separate from SANDAC, separate from SR125, separate from transit. So, you know, whichever bond investors go ahead and buy these bonds um, will be completely from the revenues that are generated from SR11. So that's why you're seeing it as local fundings, because it will be a local um, uh, issuance of our, uh, uh, you know, Otay Mesa East bonds. Thank you, Andre. Yeah. Very good. Are there any other comments? Seeing none, we will move on to item number 12A, draft 2023 regional transportation improvement program, including the draft air quality conformity determination. Mr. Radcliffe, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chair. So this is part A to item 12, and I will be following with part B. So SANDAG, serving as the region's Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, is required by state and federal laws to develop and adopt a Regional Transportation Improvement Program, or RTIP. The RTIP is a multi-year program of proposed major transportation projects that includes the Transnet program of projects. For your convenience and to reduce the number of pages in today's agenda, a link to the draft 2023 RTIP document has been provided on the agenda webpage. In May, the ITOC reviewed the new projects submitted for the 2023 RTIP, as well as the list of transnet funded projects. All new projects submitted for transnet funding were considered eligible under the terms of the ordinance. Attachment one provides a summary of the projects included in the draft 2023 RTIP organized by category to show how the region is investing available funds. This table has been organized by corridor to align with our regional vision and investments are shown by source of funds, such as federal, state, transnet, or local. This attachment includes all projects programmed in the 2023 RTIP, not just the transnet projects. Policymakers have also been interested in the split of investments by mode. Attachment two, provides two charts, one for the total RTIP, including the prior years, and one for just the FY 2023 through 2027 period covered by the 2023 RTIP. These charts illustrate how funds are being invested per transportation mode, including highway, multimodal, transit, bike pedestrian, and maintenance. For the first time, Sandag has performed a social equity analysis for the RTIP 
This analysis can be found in Appendix G of the 2023 RTIP document, and it shows that the investments in the RTIP are distributed in vulnerable communities consistent with the populations of those communities. Attachment three summarizes the eligibility requirements for projects to use transnet funding. Staff has reviewed the projects contained in the draft 2023 RTIP and has considered all projects to be eligible. The ITOC is asked to review the draft 2023 RTIP, focusing its review on the transnet program of projects, including compliance with the ordinance and requirements of SANDAG board policy number 31. Any significant comments received will be brought to the Transportation Committee on July 15th. Pending Transportation Committee recommendation, the Board of Directors will be asked to accept the draft 2023 RTIP for distribution for public review and comment at its meeting on July 22nd, 2022. A public hearing is tentatively scheduled for the September 2nd, 2022 Transportation Committee meeting to receive public testimony on the draft 2023 RTIP. The final 2023 RTIP is due to the state by October 1st, 2022. That concludes my report and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Radcliffe. Are there any public comments? I see no public commenters for item 12A. Thank you, clerk. Uh, are there any comments by members of ITOC? This is a discussion item only. Mr. Halpern. <clears throat> yeah, um, and, and thank you, Richard, for the presentation. Your reference to the analysis of the social equity, um, I was, I may have missed it. Could you point to where that is in the materials, or is that something that is a separate analysis that you're just informing us about, but um, was not included because I missed that part when I was. Reading. Oh, sure, yeah. So uh, it's if you look in um, on the agenda webpage, uh, we've posted the draft of the 2023 RTIP document in its entirety, and that social equity analysis is uh, the newly added Appendix G in mm -hmm. that document. Okay, got it. But it wasn't in our package. It was in the bigger package. No, it's in the full, it's in the full document. Yes. Got it, got it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. I'll take a look there. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Orso. Does the action that the board took on Friday, um, as far as uh, removing the user fee, have any significance on this item? Uh, no, I, Thanks for the question, Pedro. Um, I would say no, because the road user fee wasn't um, expected to go into effect until 2035, I believe, in the regional plan. And this is the short-term five-year program of projects. So none of the projects included here should be impacted by that. Thank you. Any other comments? I do have a comment, uh, attachment to, I had a hard time following that. You know, the colors are very close to each other and the key is not in the order of at least the circle. So I was having a hard time trying to figure out which is which and just for the sake of transparency and making sure members of the public understand, you know, what's what, it would be nice to either have maybe different colors or put the key in the order of the way they appear or something, because I was just, I, you know, I was really hard for me to figure out what, what is what. The colors are close enough that was making it difficult. So just a comment to pass on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. We, we did update the color scheme for the Transportation Committee report. Oh, not for us, huh? <laughs> it, was, it was too late. I apologize, but. <laughs> well, at least you've done it. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move on to item number 12B. Go ahead, please. This is the local street road output and outcome uh, report. Sure. Uh, Thank you, Chair. So yes, this is part B to item 12. And okay, so as a reminder, in the 2015 Transnet Performance Audit, recommend, recommendation number six was made, which states, expand on existing available local street and road performance output data to report and summarize on improvements made to the local streets and roads network. So staff working with the city's county transportation advisory committee or CTAC 
developed a proposed format and began collecting data in the RTIP database on planned outputs and proposed outcomes for transnet <laughs> projects. This report has been provided with every biannual RTIP update since the 2016 RTIP. With the Transportation Performance Management Initiative and the implementation of SANDAG's Enterprise Resource Planning, or ERP, their, their open finance tool, we anticipate to better align actuals with planned outputs in future iterations of the RTIP. We prepare this report whenever we perform an, an update to the RTIP. When entering their projects for the 2023 RTIP update, local agencies were asked to update their proposed outputs and outcomes for the first two years of the 2023 RTIP period, which are fiscal years 2023 and 2024. This report summarizes those proposed outputs for the categories of congestion relief and maintenance as defined in board policy number 31 and the outcomes of those efforts. Page eight of the report on page 90 of the agenda is a summary of all the outputs and outcomes. And it shows that almost 82% of planned local street and road programming for the next two years will benefit congestion relief efforts with transnet dollars leveraging almost 40% of other funds available to local agencies, including federal, gas tax, SB1, developer impact fees, and general fund dollars. This tracks very closely to the data collected for the 2021 RTIP. There aren't really any significant changes, but the 2023 RTIP reflects a slight increase in miles of roadway planned and a slight decrease in spending on bicycle and pedestrian safety outcomes when compared to the previous report. On page three of the report, which is on page 85 of the agenda, shows more detailed information for congestion relief projects. This includes the number of projects per category, the amount of transnet and other funds programmed for those projects, and the proposed output, which varies by the type of improvement. The same information is shown for maintenance projects beginning on page six of the report or page 88 of the agenda. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Radcliffe. Are there any public comments? I do not see any public commenters on this item. Thank you. Are there any comments by the members of ITOP? Mr. Halpern, go ahead. Um, thanks. You know, I really appreciate the presentation. The, um, the charts illustrate um, the intent for the prog each of the projects in a really nice, clear way. You know, I think we all know that um, the output part of the equation has always been a lot easier than the outcome part of the equation. Um, and so I'm just curious um, if you could comment with regard to the outcomes. These obviously are all hoped for outcomes, right? And would you say that in, in really in all cases that you guys have really clear plans for how you're going to be measuring the outcomes as opposed to just kind of taking for granted that these things tend to happen? I think it's our hope that with the ERP system, there will be more connection there to try and help us actually evaluate, you know, whether the, the outcomes are actually, uh, whether there's any alignment there. Um, because like you said, that's kind of the, the tricky part is the, the outcomes over the, the outputs. <laughs> yeah, so I guess then just, you know, a thought I'd want to um, plant in your minds. Um, I, I would just be a little careful about, um, you know, how, presenting the outcomes part of this, un unless you guys are really clear that you're going to have the capacity and ability to clearly measure these things. Because I think one of the problems in the past is that the outcomes have just been kind of taken for granted that they naturally flow from the outputs. And, you know, I think um, one of the things where the agency's shown tremendous improvement over the past few years is its focus on data and using data for planning purposes. But presumably, I think, you know, from a taxpayer perspective, board perspective, also reflecting the return on the investment, if you will. Um, if, if there's if there's still some uncertainty as to the ability in measuring the outcomes, I would just maybe you know sort of soften a little bit the um, 
the way in which it's presented because the way it's presented now it it seems very much like you know you're expecting these outcomes to happen and at some point whether it's the board or this committee or members of the public I think are going to really want to see the ability for you to demonstrate that. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you hear what I'm saying. Um, and I'm not suggesting it's easy. All I'm suggesting is that if you're going to talk about these outcomes in the in the clear way, which is admirable, um, I, I'd really hope that you all, there are folks working on also being able to demonstrate that clearly with the data following the uh, launch of the projects. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Halpern, uh, go ahead, Mr. Frankel. Thank you, uh, Richard. Thank you for the presentation. I also found this this to be very helpful, um, useful. I think kind of dovetailing on the, the comment about outcomes, two things. I mean, I noticed the category of traffic operations, as, as compared to all the other categories, that is a primarily transnet funded category. Um, it's very transnet heavy. Um, and there, there are two items there with respect to traffic signal coordination and interconnection that I've been hearing more and more about uh, industry wide about adaptive signalization, um, leveraging 5G technology, perhaps to coordinate um, our signals in a way where you don't necessarily have to increase roadway capacity, but you can really, uh, really achieve that 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 congestion relief. Um, and so I'd be interested to hear more about some of these programs. I would imagine that that's data that perhaps would be easier to obtain, um, I, I, would, I would think. Um, and so I would be interested in hearing um, you know, more about those programs in terms of the outcome. Um, and, and to Stuart's point, I think we have to look at uh, you know, expenditures relative to the outcome. And so how are we getting the most bang for our buck here? Mm -hmm. If we can do adaptive signal timing for, you know, I'm making this number up, you know, $100,000 uh, for every 10 miles, you know, what is that relative to what it costs to do widenings, uh, especially in the new, newly constructed lanes? You know, how are we using our dollars most efficiently and mm -hmm. leveraging technology? If there's, you know, any way to, to, to bring the, the, that that concept back to us in the future, that would be appreciated. Thank See, you. Thank you, Mr. Halpern and Franco. That was th those were really good comments, and hope uh, uh, Sandex staff will follow up on those. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, looks like I don't see any other comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ratcliffe, uh, for your presentation. We'll move on to item number 13, which is North Coast Corridor Status Update. And welcome, Mr. Kossip. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Alan Kossip uh, with Caltrans. I'm the uh, NCC Corridor Director. And bring up the presentation here. Uh, next slide. Just to remind everyone, uh, when we give the, this update, we're really talking about a portfolio of improvements, uh, North Coast Corridor, uh, basically starting at the merge, 5805 merge going up to 78. Um, majority of these improvements have been constructed or are being constructed under a CMGC contract with um, FSSW. And uh, really the components of, the, of these, uh, of the contract uh, extend the carpool lanes from uh, Solana Beach up to uh, SR78, uh, complete uh, a double track and uh, bridge replacement at San Alejo for Los San Corridor, a number of active transportation um, improvements and also the restoration of the San Alejo Lagoon. And uh, we've been coming here since 2017. We've got lots of great news in the last quarter in terms of many of these um, projects uh, open and opening to the public. So lots of good news today. Next slide. And I think uh, many of you had an opportunity to come to our June 4th um, ribbon cutting for the active transportation uh, set of improvements, as well as the uh, substantial completion of the lagoon restoration on June 4th. And then next slide. And a little, and a few months earlier, uh, we had opened the HOVs carpool lanes from uh, Solana Beach up to Palomar Airport Road in February, March 22. So next couple of slides are just sort of hitting some of those highlights about um, you know, just kind of take you down memory road of what we were able to complete. Um, this is what it looked like in 2017 at Manchester, I-5 in Manchester, San Alejo Lagoon, uh, when we first started. And you can see the, the narrow channel there. Um, and here's what it looks like today. 
So, you know, the new bridge is essentially double the length. Um, uh, earlier this year, just a couple of months ago, we restored tidal flushing to the eastern channel or to the eastern part of the lagoon, um, which was a major accomplishment. Next slide. And if you haven't been down there, we also have a uh, hanging bridge, um, which really was a major component of the project and it connects uh, Solana Beach to Encinitas and the Cardiff area. Uh, next slide. And so the, the package of active transportation improvements in this uh, grand opening last month really allows uh, a, a couple of things. As I mentioned, it's the, it's the connection of Encinitas and Solana Beach for active transportation. Uh, and as well as a loop around the uh, the lagoon, uh, now you can you know basically uh, you know do the whole uh, circle, and then as well as get under uh, the low sand corridor and connect to the coast. Um, you know for years that was that was I five and low sand were a barrier for active transportation uh, east west, and now we've given you uh, several places to to cross. So next slide. And here's what that connection looks like on the ground. Um, this is basically st standing at the uh, Manchester new, uh, the new bridge across the lagoon, looking south towards Solana Beach. Uh, above you is the, above the retaining wall is the I-5 lanes. Next slide. Uh, this is what it looks like um, in the, uh, adjacent to the, uh, the water reclamation plant in, uh, in Cardiff. And uh, this was this trail was built in partnership with um, the water reclamation plant as they were in, uh, you know, enlarging, improving their facility, uh, gave us a, an opportunity to work with them and build active transportation through their facility. Next slide. Uh, this is what the new Vista Point looks like. You know, for years we had I-5 had a Vista Point across the lagoon. It's been closed since 2016. Um, it just reopened last month, and uh, it is part of the active transportation trail too. So if you're moving between uh, Solana Beach and Cardiff, uh, now you go through the uh, through the Vista Point. Next slide. Um, along Manchester, uh, if, if, if you're familiar with that area, you, you basically used to walk in the in the shoulder of Manchester. Uh, now there's a brand new. Uh, uh, bike and pedestrian facility there on the south side of the facility. Next slide. And this is the uh, the box that we built several years ago, but still is a part of this portfolio under the low sand corridor. And this is the this is the, um, the feature that allows that east west connectivity to the beach. Next slide. Uh, also, in the last few months, we uh, uh, finished the last of the beach nourishment uh, projects, um, and this was the material that was coming out from underneath um, the I-5 bridge, and so that is now complete as well. Next slide. So looking at the, the uh, portfolio of, of improvements uh, under the FSSW contract, there are contractor um, the green check marks are the, uh, the contracts that are complete. Um, and we really just got two projects that are left um, under that 800 and say $70 million package. Um, there's some still improvements that we're working on between Manchester and Palomar as it relates to planting, some retaining wall or some uh, sound walls. You know, the, the, all the lanes are open. Uh, we just got some auxiliary improvements that we need to complete. Um, as well as the park and ride over there at Manchester at the, um, what would be the, the Northeast Quadrant, uh, there'll be a new park and ride. And those were all, all those, those features will be complete by January of 23. Um, the Palomar to 78 uh, segment, which is what folks see out there in construction today, um, the carpool lanes will, should be open by early 23. So essentially seven, eight months from now. Um, but then we've got a second phase uh, to build some operational improvements, some sound walls, and some community enhancements in Carlsbad. So the complete package will be uh, complete by early 24. Next slide. Uh, I did want to highlight, uh, if you haven't had a chance to get up to that section between uh, Palomar Airport Road, and 78, uh, we are testing some new orange striping uh, 
testing uh, piloting a couple of different approaches. And the idea of this is to use the orange stripe in, in concert with our traditional white stripe to remind people that they're in a construction zone. Um, you know, on these long construction uh, projects, it's, it's common for all of us to kind of forget where we are. We, you know, we try to bring the speeds down and then you're a mile into it, you kind of forget you're in a construction zone, speeds start creeping up again. And so this orange striping is to, you know, to continually raise the awareness of the driver. Um, if you have used it and you have some thoughts about it, uh, we do have a um, survey uh, because it is a pilot and we're trying to understand how the public, uh, you know, whether they, they think it's effective or if it's confusing. Um, so link is down there. Interestingly enough, um, today we've got about 80% positive feedback. Um, and these days I can't get 80% agreement on anything. So I will definitely take that as uh, moving in the right direction. <laughs> Um, next slide. And then uh, this is what the park and ride looks like. Uh, this is going to be, in addition to the park and ride, it's, it's a multimodal center. Uh, we're working with uh, Nature uh, Collective at the Lagoon. Um, and so that will be complete probably uh, early next year as well. Last slide. I shouldn't say last slide. Next slide. And then um, sort of outside of the FSSW project that we've been working on, uh, we have a new project, which is the restoration of the Sandigito Lagoon. Um, I bring it up because if you drive through there, you're probably wondering what's, what's all that construction off to the east. And um, you know, it's great news. It's, it's uh, a major mitigation, uh, essentially uh, removing all that material um, that had been dumped there over the years for uh, agricultural purposes. And we're actually at the end of this project, we'd be adding close to 60, some 64 acres of, of brand new wetlands, which now can be the mitigation for, um, you know, projects like the Batiquitas Low Sand Double Track or San Diego, um Double Track. So really important project, um, making good progress. It's also a CMGC project. Um, contractor is Marathon Construction. Uh, Marathon, uh, just as a note, Marathon was also the contractor for San Alejo. Um, so, next slide. So, where do we go from here? Um, and what you would you know expect to see? Uh, touched on a couple of the things. Um, complete the HOVs by early next year. Uh, complete the multi-use facility by at Manchester by early next year. Um, we award that final contract uh, probably later this year, and that's the contract with the uh, Carlsbad Community en Enhancements, the sound walls, and some operational improvements. And of note, those operational improvements um, add a lot of technology features to the corridor, to the entire corridor. So we've been sort of waiting till the end of the project to get the latest and greatest of the, uh, of the technology that we can install. And then um, lastly, uh, this year, the second half of this year, we're going to begin work on the HOV to express lane conversion project. When I say begin work, uh, project development work. So uh, first thing we'll be doing is working with the public to understand, uh, you know, their areas of, convert, of concerns when we go to a um, uh, express lane project, uh, express lane configuration, um, you know, level of understanding and, and so forth so that we get the project right. Uh, any that wraps up my report today. Uh, kind of with a nice photo, but uh, any questions? Next slide. Thank you, Mr. Kossif. That's a beautiful photo. Beautiful project. Uh, let's see if there are any comments by the members of public. I see no public commenters on this item. Thank you, Clerk. Uh, it looks like I have several cameras up. Uh, Mr. Fuller, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, no, not really questions. I just comment in general. Um, drive that area pretty much every day from Oceanside to the Del Mar Fairgrounds. Um, see the improvements. I, I do notice a, a um, difference in the time it takes me to travel to and from work um, uh, in a positive way. Um, so just it looks great. Look forward to uh, seeing that end of the uh, HOV lanes all the way up to the 78. Take my kids and take advantage of that. 
Very good. Mr. Orso, do you have a comment? I have uh, a couple of them, but first I have a question for Mr. Kossop. I'm going through memory lane and I'm trying to remember when did you became the corridor director on I-5? Uh, probably about 2006. Ah, okay. I was thinking it was a little bit earlier than that, but well done. I mean, it, it looks beautiful and, you know, it, 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 it should be with pride and joy for the entire team and, you know, let them know that we really appreciate everything that we're seeing out there. I had the opportunity to bike um, underneath the new hanging bridge and, and it's really cool, you know. Can you tell us what the um, uh, Vista Point, the, the rocks and all of that up above, it, it looks like a Medusa or what is it? A jellyfish. A jellyfish. It looks beautiful. Thank you very much. And thank the team, Ellen, along. please. Please thank the team for all of their hard work. I mean, it's been, you know, 18, almost going to be 18 years of love that you all been doing out there. So congratulations. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, members? Uh, Mr. Halpern, go ahead. Thanks, um, and, and thanks for the update, Alan. You know, um, you highlighted the what you referred to as the operational improvements, I think, um, relating to the HOV lanes. And one thing, I, if you could just refresh our memories, I know in the past there was money that I think the board actually took out of the budget relating to the electronics and things of that nature because my sense was that they feared it would be used to implement a uh, sort of a pay system. But as you've been doing the um, the upgrades um, in the North Coast um, corridor, have you been in fact, um, do you have the money? Have you in fact been implementing all those electronics that would facilitate the, the variety of technology solutions that could be brought to bear in the HOV lanes and otherwise? Yeah, and I think that's an important point, the variety, right? Um, and some of the things that we're looking at and, and, and what you wanna do is put the infrastructure in so that you can easily plug and play. And then as the, as the technology changes that you can, you know, you're flexible, you can just in, integrate that uh, and, and not have to dig stuff up again. So uh, that's definitely in there. That sort of first generation of technology, we're looking at some of the V2X uh, applications and we're gonna pilot three or four. Uh, one of particular interest is, is wrong way uh, detection uh, that would actually allow the freeway to talk to uh, people through like their Sirius or XM radio. If you've got a brand new car, it would talk directly to the car uh, to warn folks that you know someone has entered the freeway the wrong way. Um, that's an application we're interested very much in. Uh, queue detection, um, same sort of thing where the freeway would talk to the vehicles and say, hey, you know, FY, queue ahead or uh, employees on the on the boots on the ground, either construction or maintenance. Um, and so all that technology is, is available today, um, you know, and we need to get it up and running. Uh, as it relates to the HOV to HOT conversion, um, the board did uh, program that project in the last 12 months. So we do have funds for it. Great, appreciate that. So there's really, it's not just about um, having charging in lanes. There's a wide variety of technology solutions that you are in fact embedding as you're building this. So. Yeah, and they're not all about vehicles, right? We've got some technology applications as it relates to intersections, smart intersections, um, and if folks run red lights and, and that sort of thing, how can we make it safer for active transportation? So we've got some things we're gonna pilot uh, at those intersections in that last phase as well. Great, thanks, appreciate the elaboration. No more questions for me. Thank you, Mr. Halpern. I have a couple of questions as well. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations to you and the entire team. It looks great beautiful project and we wish you success to complete the rest of it. I know, Ellen, you, this has been your baby for a long time. So, and your baby's growing finally. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so uh, tell me about your experience with the CMGC. Uh, you know, what feedback you have? Are there any lessons learned? Yeah, and one of the things we owe you is that evaluation. Um, and one of the our points has been really until the project is complete, it's hard to complete that evaluation because some of it is, you know, are we going to get claims from contractors and, and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and what's your exposure on some of those issues? Uh, to date, everything's been a huge success for us, so much so that, you know, at, at least on the Caltrans side, and, you know, that's becoming one of our go-to procurement strategies. Um, the state has, uh, you know, we're doing this middle mob broadband project. We just actually put a, a brand new CMGC contract out yesterday uh, for broadband in San Diego, East County, rural. Um, and so, and we can, we'll, we'll bring you back that analysis um, on, on projects that are really complex where you don't really have a lot of experience and there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of underground work, a lot of uh, geotechnical, uh, like we did at the uh, at the lagoon, uh, you found, I found that we all worked together to solve them, right? We could have easily, I think on other projects, um, you know, it, it, the contractor leaves and tells the owner, when you figure it out, come back to me. Um, that wasn't the case, right? And it was project first, um, for the entire team. And I think you see the results of that, some really creative solutions. The contractor found different ways to build it. Um, you know, it, it's hard for us to know which contractor we get uh, when we do low bid and what technology they're going to use when the contractor is available. Um, you can sort of fine tune the project for what, you know, how they want to build it. And I think you get a better project um, for that. And so I think there's many examples that we can provide on you know and, and this project has no claims um it's on time on budget so um a project in the marine environment i think that's really rare um with the coastal commission and, and so forth so we're very happy with the process Wonderful. and that you kind of answer my next question because i was wondering as of now and pending availability of all the funds do you expect to be done within budget and schedule yeah, I think the the last the last remaining risk for us is that last segment. Uh, we haven't bid that last segment with them, right? We haven't established a cost. Uh, yeah. We'll do that in the second half of this year, and and we know we've got escalation throughout industry on this issue. Um, but we're still confident that we're going to deliver the project within uh, the approved budget. Very good. And lastly, uh, I have driven through with the orange uh, stripes and. Uh, it's an interesting idea. I'm wondering, you know, if there are other parts of the country that are employing this type of uh, technique, and if you have any early data or feedback on it. So the only thing we have in feedback is this, is so far as the public survey, which is very positive. There are some other states that have tried it, uh, different versions of it, um, and we've kind of, you know, taken what they've done and, and tweaked it a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also video cameraing it. We've got we're working with CHP uh, in, in order to see how people drive it. Uh, one of the things is just trying to get speeds down. Mm. Uh, you know, we had a very active you know drive 55 in the construction zone, but the reality is um, you know the we didn't see a great uh, you know drop in speeds, and so I think anything we can do to continue to reinforce it. Very good. Thank you so much. And again, congratulations to all of you for what you've accomplished so far and good luck. Thank you. Um, all right, we'll move on to item number 14, which is an update on Midcoast Transit Project, another very large successful project. And we have Greg Gastelum here. Welcome, Greg, go ahead. Good morning, Chair House and committee members. My name is Greg Gastelum. I'm the principal, I'm a principal engineer with SANDAG and acting project director for the Midcoast project. After the opening of the Midcoast trolley extension in November 2021, we are making great progress to complete remaining project closeout activities. Next slide. Uh, just to recap, the Midcoast corridor transit project uh, provided 11 mile extension of our UC San Diego Blue Line trolley uh, that included the addition of nine new trolley stations, 36 new cars added to our fleet or MTS's fleet, 
And um, it was delivered uh, through construction manager general contractor delivery method uh, by uh, Mid Coast Transit Constructors, who was a joint venture of Stacy and Whitback, Herzog, and um, Skanska. Uh, we built the project here at San Sandag for uh, in hand in hand with FTA and MTS, and now MTS is operating the facility. Next slide. Uh, with the completion of the project, we have now added uh, the, or expanded our system to 65 miles with 62 stations and provide a one seat ride from the international border all the way up to the university community of the city of San Diego. Next slide. Here's a time frame of the project to give you a little uh, snapshot of where we're at. Uh, again, the project was opened back in November of 2021, and we're looking to complete remaining construction activities, punch list and whatnot, um, hopefully by um, this fall. And so everything is continuing to stay on track. We'll be continuing on with a closeout and some administration work, and then uh, also doing some final reports required by our full funding grant agreement uh, with FTA. Next slide. Remaining construction activities uh, include interim parking accommodations for the Claremont Trolley Station. We're continuing to wrap up some minor roadway improvements throughout the corridor. Uh, some minor uh, revisions to station elevators and doing some landscape and plant establishment throughout the corridor. And uh, final touches will be the wayfinding signage to uh, facilitate um, directions uh, from the interstates and local roads, as well as within uh, shopping malls and uh, areas adjacent to our stations. Next slide. Other activities include right away. Uh, we still have a few parcels to um, come to a uh, settlement with property owners. Uh, we're looking at all our research agency permits and making certain that we have met all the conditions associated with each one of the permits so we can close those out. Again, some construction administration remaining on the construction contract as well as the overall project. And then we're also coordinating with uh, private development and accommodating additional parking for the Claremont station. Next slide. As part of our right-of-way agreement with the property owner that is directly across from the Claremont station, uh, they, uh, as part of their development, will provide 150 parking facilities to accommodate transit users. And in the interim, we have uh, worked with the city of San Diego and we'll be doing some widening on the northbound lanes of Marina Boulevard directly across from the station and provide uh, five parking stalls that are uh, in compliance with ADA requirements to uh, uh, address uh, or at least facilitate uh, those parking, temporary parking uh, during the interim period of when the developer gets uh, started with his construction. Next slide. From the Balboa Avenue Transit Center to the Claremont Station, we're going to be doing some uh, parking or uh, pavement uh, improvements to uh, actually bike lane striping and uh, pavement delineation to enhance the bikeway lane that goes in the southbound direction between these two stations. Uh, the majority of uh, the work at Balboa Station has been complete. Next slide, please. We're continuing to uh, wrap up a lot of our construction punch list items at uh, the Nobel Drive trolley station. Uh, included would be the minor uh, revisions to the elevators and also completing some uh, minor uh, changes to the uh, parking structure that was constructed at this location. Next slide. At the UC San Diego campus, uh, for their central campus trolley station, we have uh, pretty much completed all of the landscaping in Pepper Canyon, which is just underneath and to the south of the station. And again, we're continuing to uh, work with the elevators to update those or upgrade uh, the uh, efforts on uh, the systems on those. And uh, we're basically gonna be turning a lot of that over to UC San Diego in the near future as uh, plan establishment periods com get completed. Next slide. This is a photo of the UC San Diego Health La Jolla trolley station. 
Again, there's some minor uh, modifications to the elevators ongoing. And we also have some uh, permanent uh, gates that need to be uh, installed at this location, as well as the central campus location. And that work is uh, underway and uh, again, looking to be completed by uh, late summer. Next slide, please. At the executive drive trolley station, again, we have some minor modifications to the elevators and the majority of the work has been completed and uh, um, we will be doing some uh, minor wayfinding signage at this location as well. Next slide. And at the terminal station, the UTC Transit Center, uh, again, some uh, elevator improvements uh, for the comms effort. And then we also have added an additional doorway to better facilitate access directly from the uh, MTS parking structure that we built as part of this project. So that will provide a more direct uh, means to get to the trolley station as well as the uh, transit center from our parking facility. Next slide. So with there, um, you know, this is basically unprecedented collaboration with all parties that have been involved. Uh, the, you know, it's uh, one of those uh, projects that, you know, everything, when we were addressing problems, it was project first from all levels. Uh, and uh, with that success, we are, we are still continuing to wrap this up. We uh, opened up the project a year earlier than anticipated in our schedule, and we are still uh, within budget to deliver the project. So with that, that concludes my update and I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Gastelum. Uh, are there any public comments? Uh, I don't know if clerk is still with us, but. Yes, I'm sorry, there are no hands raised. There's no public commenters on this item. Thank you, Tessa. All right, uh, members of ITOP. Do you have any comments, questions? Mr. Halpern, go ahead. Thanks. Um, great presentation. Thanks, Greg. Um, one question I have is that my vague recollection is that um, prior to the opening of the Blue Line extension, um, there were estimates of an incre incremental ridership of something like 20,000 a day, if I'm not mistaken, or whatever that number was. I'm just curious if you guys have got any um, information on increased ridership from the opening of the extension. You, you know, we, we are tracking that um, based on some May uh, data. We had seen an increase uh, apparently of 3.1% 3, 3 from the previous uh, month. So we're going tracking in the right direction. Uh, as of uh, late June, we're estimating that we're going to have around 7,000 boardings within the nine new Midsco stations and another five boardings within the Blue Line stations that's uh, between Santa Fe Depot and Old Town. So we're, we're keeping track of that. Uh, as far as individual riderships, we're anticipating that probably at the UC San Diego stations, uh, while they're out of session for summer, that the, the numbers may dip. But right. that's expected, right? And but we're very hopeful that they'll jump right back up as they were in the spring and continue to uh, expand. Uh, as part of one of our closeout responsibilities, uh, we do a final report to FTA, and that includes uh, an assessment of ridership uh, on the system as a whole prior to the construction of the project and the operation of the project. So uh, we will be starting to do some onboard survey counts in the near future. And, uh, and start supplementing those with actual data numbers and then start doing an assessment of how we did, how well we did with our original projections that we included in our environmental reports. Great, thanks. And I just have one other question. Um, I also recall at the time the project was still in planning phase, um, there was some um, uh, concerns or feedback expressed in terms of, particularly in that Balboa station, um, the fact that it didn't include a specific way to get people from the east side of the five um, to connect to the west side and beach access, et cetera. 
Um, and could you update us on whether there have been any discussions with City of San Diego or other solutions as to what's being done to, you know, utilize the fact that that station is just a couple of miles from the beach and to create access to the beaches from that station? I, I thank, thank you for the question. Good question. Um, I, I don't have any specific information on, on specific projects, but we still we certainly are looking at improving uh, the station at Balboa as well as all our stations to upgrade them as mobility hubs. Inclusive of that would be other alternative means of uh, transit uh, to uh, support um, active transportation as well as other uh, means to get to the station from the west side of the project. So uh, more to come on that. And uh, we, we, we certainly will be pursuing uh, and continuing to work as we have been, as an example, the, uh, the additional bike lane striping on Marina Boulevard. Uh, the reason we're only doing on the southbound side is because we, uh, the city has a project to uh, build that, uh, uh, that water project down the, the opposite side. And so we said, well, let's fit, you know, at least start this and then they could finish up and, and complete the corridor at least for the bicycle usage. So those are things we're working continually with the city of San Diego on. And then we'll continue to work with Caltrans of the city to um, possibly expand service and, and improve service uh, with MTS to the west side of the corridor. Gotcha. And maybe this is more of a city of San Diego thing than you, but I'm, I'm just curious if things like that um, downtown Fred concept or other shuttle type concepts are even in the discussion phase. Uh, although, like I said, I recognize that might be more city of San Diego than San Diego. Those are good questions. And, and if you, uh, I can get back to you on some of the planning efforts that we have um, working together with the city on uh, to improve these mobility hub locations. Yeah, maybe for the, the next time there's an update, that would be an interesting thing to talk about. Because I know there was a lot in the press and um, about that um, notion, you know, and it fits in with social equity as well, right? Is providing beach access to the transit riders. But thank you, thank you for the elaboration. Mr. Cos, hey. would you like to add anything? You have your camera. Yeah, um, just as an FYI, um, the state. Uh, Caltrans in partnership with Sandag and Caltrans completed a feasibility study at three interchanges, the Balboa, Claremont, and SeaWorld. Uh, we completed that probably two months ago, three months ago. And the type of improvements would be similar to what we did at Encinitas where, or, or Solana Beach, where we kind of pushed back the uh, abutment walls under the bridge and tried to get a new you know, uh, sidewalk in. Each of those three locations has its own challenges, uh, but we did find uh, solutions for all three. And now we're working with the three partners to um, both chase grants uh, for the construction of those improvements or uh, you know, fund the first phases like environmental clearance or um, uh, design. So we are off and, and running. Balboa is probably the most problematic just because of the surrounding developments there. It's, it's hard to get something through. Very good. Thank you very much. Are there any other members questions for uh, Mr. Gastel? I don't see any. I do have a couple of questions. Uh, tell us a little bit about this elevator upgrade that you're doing in pretty much every station. What is that about? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> gonna get a little technical, but yeah, uh, here I'll. Give it a shot here. Um, uh, during the, the construction of elevators, we had some uh, conduits that served uh, fire alarm uh, initiating uh, devices that uh, serve each one of the um, elevators. And uh, there was uh, um, the, the requirement according to the uh, state uh, elevator inspector was that some of the conduits that were serving these facilities needed to be on the exterior of the uh, hoistway that right now they were currently inside the elevator and so uh, the hoistway area and so uh, that was a safety concern on their part and, they, and so we agreed that well if we can continue to open and, and operate the elevators you know by you know within a year's time we will upgrade and relocate those conduits to the exterior of these uh, each one of the elevators. So there's 11 elevators that are included. Uh, we are basically going to be running conduit uh, uh, alongside um, the um, 
spider clips or, or the, the fastening devices that uh, adhere the panels, the, the glass panels. So uh, we spent a lot of time and effort to look because we were very proud of the aesthetics of those facilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we figured out a way where we could put a stainless steel conduit system to serve all these devices and still um, have a, a good, clean look to each location. So okay. we are starting work on that now. And uh, we've gotten all uh, folks involved um, up to speed with that. And uh, and we have already issued a change order to get the work accomplished. So that work is underway. Thank you. Uh, my other question is about ridership. I know this is still a new project and you know that this is a large investment in the future and hopefully ridership will continue to grow um, maybe uh, in the uh, future presentations, it would be great if you could address um, the progress in ridership or even have MTS maybe make a presentation so we can continue to monitor that. And my really other uh, question would be, what is MTS doing or what would MTS do to promote and increase ridership in this? You know, we spend a lot of money on this project, so we got to make sure that the public is aware and is uh, enjoying and taking advantage of that. I know the students at UCSD would probably have, uh, you know, a good, um, you know, facility to use. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, points of interest along the way. So, um, so we'll look forward to getting more information from you on that, so. It's a great idea. We will definitely include that next time. Thank you, Mr. Gastelum. Okay, that ends uh, or concludes this item. Our next uh, item is uh, the future meeting, uh, which is going to be in September. August 10 was our scheduled meeting, but we typically go dark in August. So um, with that, before I end my tenure as chair, I just want to first of all thank everyone for participating. Uh, I want to first thank all um, uh, uh, Sandax staff, especially the support staff to uh, ITALK. You all do a very good job. You're diligent in your work. And I know you, you work very hard to make sure that we keep our promises to the public, to the taxpayers, and you keep us on the right path. So I do want to thank and appreciate that. I do want to thank our uh, ITALK members for volunteering and for really engaging. This was a, uh, I think, uh, a busy active year for us as it's indicated in our annual report and everyone really engaged and you all volunteered. I know you have other jobs and other lives as well. So thank you again for your support and for being here and continuing to support. So. It's been my honor and pleasure to serve as your chair. I am looking forward to passing the baton to Mr. Frankel and Mr. Orso. I also want to thank my vice chair, Mr. Halpern. You've been a tremendous mentor and support to me and your experiences has been very helpful. So thank you all for your support. So any other last comments? <laughs> Bravo, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. With that, our meeting is adjourned. We'll see you all in September. Thank you, Sonny. Great job. Thank you, Appreciate everyone. You, thank you, Sonny. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. You, Carlos. <laughs>